at the pace of our rapidly changing world, Rwanda has committed to a laser focus on building the strengths of the youth and creating a solid foundation for them to launch themselves into the future. We focus on a compelling narrative, one of energy and vision, as we focus on young minds in Rwanda and Africa. We're the next generation and we can't rely on anyone else to create the world that we want to see. So we have to come up with those solutions. And it can even be in small ways. You know, you don't have to be the one to come up with the actual idea or the startup, but you can support them in ways that they need support so that we're all working together to build that world that we want to see. If you're creating a solution, I believe you're also creating other job opportunities. So like if you create a solution, it's one of the ways for you to create job jobs, new jobs in the market. And uh, it's one of the ways to also reduce some of the existing gaps in the market. So like uh, it's really important that we also like uh, instead of applying for jobs, uh, we can also look around and create new solutions by offering also other job opportunities around. Youth have an important role in economic development. First, the curiosity that they bring is something that we should cherish. I was reminded, looking at the youth uh, today, of a young 23-year-old Isaac Newton, who, when he was somewhere in the grounds of Cambridge, was so annoyed by an apple falling on his head that he asked the question, why is this apple falling this way to the ground and not that way towards the sky? A ridiculous question indeed, but one that is responsible for what we know today about gravitational physics. It's that kind of curiosity that we need in young people because the world needs their energy, it needs that curiosity. I think maybe uh, as uh, someone that's in the younger generation, I think there's a fresh perspective on how to solve things in an easier way. And uh, I think um, that helps, that helps al uh, along the way in being able to uh, try different things uh, and then see what fits and also being able to solve our own problems. Uh, I think when we were trying to figure out uh, our solution, one thing that hit hard was the amount of waste that was uh, out there in landfills. And uh, even before, like we could link what the farmer is missing and the resources. So it's a whole cycle we're trying to, it's a loop, that hence the name Lupa. So uh, that fresh eye of uh, spotting opportunities um, and being able to try, uh, take the leap of faith, is I think what the youth is bringing on the table right now. Well, I think the world is faced with huge challenges and therefore we have, invest, have to invest in young people. And the idea behind Unleash is actually to bringing young people together to unleash their potential, unleash their ideas with help of facilitators, with help of experts here. We have experts within the different tracks here, helping them to formulating a problem, going into ideation phase, prototyping a solution and presenting it. And again, I'm, again, as being university professor, I'm really impressed by how far they get in just one week here. Very innovative, uh, great solutions here. Rwanda is a country of 1,000 hills. Now it's also a country of 1,000 talents and 1,000 ambassadors. We explore how these young enterprising minds are crafting solutions and creating collaborations that are transcending borders. So we've been operational for about seven months now. We primarily do work in the DRC, um, but also a bit in Nigeria. Well, so one of the biggest issues in a lot of African countries is the lack of access to reliable electricity. And so that leads to people having to use different sources to gain lighting. So that includes traditional diesel generators. Um, it also includes kerosene lanterns and candles. But, you know, these other solutions aren't great. Kerosene lanterns cause about 600,000 deaths on the continent in one year. And um, 
generators are loud, they're very polluting to the air, and candles are just inefficient. And so we've created and manufactured portable battery packs um, that renters can use for $2 a day. And they're actually powered by solar energy. Actually, when we started, uh, I have a co-founder, he's Kenyan. So we went through like a thousand of ideas but one thing we are on the same page is that we didn't want to do what the traditional healthcare system looks like. So we did the market research and uh, one of the reasons that came up of why people don't do checkups or don't even care as part of the lack of information, it's also the time. The time and then the availability. If I want to get my blood pressure checked, I have to leave my home, go to a hospital, go through all those waiting lines to get a basic screening like blood pressure or blood sugar. So we're like, uh, how Take came in, Take allows you to uh, provide healthcare services without being there in person. It cuts down on the time, it brings accessibility to the unserved communities. So we like wanted to do something Take and we're also focusing on young people, so we wanted to bring something that young people can relate to, not just books with information. Uh, well, we've been able to help numerous business owners by we have been giving them our product to use and try out, and um, they've been able to tell us that they've been keeping their businesses open for longer because before when they would lose electricity they would have to close down and that means you know customers weren't coming in and they weren't receiving that revenue but now that we've been helping they've been able to stay open and so they've been making more money um, and then we actually also sell our generators uh, or our battery packs and um, we have had some interest from large solar distributors that want to take our battery packs and pair it with their solar panels so that they can sell it to their customers. And so we recently had a letter of interest for a thousand of our battery packs to be sold that way. The hospitals are there, so what's the new thing? We ended up um, bringing in AI, so we use uh, transdermal technology, it basically reflects light to your face and then it's able to detect the blood flow through your vessels and you're able to know your blood pressure and through the application by just putting in your height, your weight, you're able, they, it's able to tell you your BMI, give you the normal range, let you know what that actually means. If you need follow up, if you need, if you need additional help on top of that and that has allowed us to reach the untapped market, the people who are not necessarily reached with the existing services. Let's say the old people who are somewhere, somewhere down in the village, or even the people who, don't, who have no idea this thing exists. Through a pool of agents we have, we have close to 100 agents, so they are ambassadors in their own communities, and they're the ones doing this awareness and screening uh, for this untapped market. For the most part, my co-founder and I have been relying on a $10,000 grant that we received from an accelerator program that we entered, um, it's called Divinc, and we have taken that $10,000 and really stretched it. Um, otherwise, we haven't received any outside investments, and so we've just been putting in our own money. Um, but I will say that our profit margins are really good. Um, it, t it costs us about $80 to make one unit, but we can sell it for, or we do sell it for $220. December has been filled with vibrancy as young people took center stage with various events that happened in Kigali. Unleash Rwanda, an innovation lab for the Sustainable Development Goals, where hundreds of young change makers from all over the world convened in Kigali. It has been fantastic to have Unleash in the African continent. I could not think of any better place than going to Rwanda here. And uh, we have had 1,000 talents here in Rwanda for a week now, from 136 different nations here. 
200 of these came from Rwanda, around 60% came from the African continent, but still it's a very diverse group, gender diversity is close to 50. And um, it's very dedicated, very innovative young people, hardworking people. We met here at the convention center here last Saturday and started the Unleash event here. And since then the talent has been working on some of their solutions. And what is amazing to me is that we have actually many, many different countries represented here from around the world. They are working together in groups of typically five, maybe five from five different continents. They do not know each other beforehand, but during this week here, they have worked together, created friendship and long lasting impact. Uh, yesterday morning, we had 170 different solutions coming up to solution to the 17 sustainable development goals. And today we had some of the winners presented here. Uh, this has been a fantastic week here and great support from the government in Rwanda here, from a number of different foundations here and uh, I'm very pleased chairman right now. The experience has been really amazing. It's been super helpful. Um, so the Unleash Plus program has been a six month long process. Um, but being here this week, we've been able to meet with several um, experts and our mentors, and we've gotten a lot of feedback on our pitch. And then we were, of course, selected um, as the top ten, one of the top ten teams um, for Unleash Plus. So it's it's been a great journey. So. Uh, my experience has been good. It's um, uh, it was kind of uh, oh, kind of uh, kind of uh, kind of uh, terrifying in the first moment like working with people from different places and trying to connect with them all but then I got along and we kind of uh, built a very strong bond together. It's been amazing to have this opportunity you know um, I think one of the big things that entrepreneurs need is a community to be able to lean on because um, you know, when you start a company, there are a lot of things that you don't know. So you need people to be able to go to, to figure out what the next step should be. And being part of Unleash has been that community that they've been able to show us, you know, okay, you have this, but you need this now, so. We also saw the largest in-person technology events in Rwanda designed to ignite and inspire innovation. Hunger Pitch Fest, returning for its third edition. I think this is the third edition and, and one of the things that I do appreciate about um, Rwandan entrepreneurs is they really tackle most of the critical challenges um, that we have um, in Rwanda, be it in employment, in agriculture, in health, um, and in, in climate. They're tackling really very great the fundamental problems for all of us in, in Rwanda and one of the things that I've appreciated and I think it has grown is seeing that most of them although they're creating or even tackling solutions that we usually think of as social problems I am seeing very innovative and fantastic business models that are coming out of it so which means that one um, there's avenues for them to um, for them to actually grow these ventures and, 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 and conquer the world, um, but also then tackling those solutions in a more financially sustainable way um, as we grow it. So people can expect this to see more amazing ideas. We've seen previous winners that have really made uh, great strides in what they've done and we, we, we do not expect less from, uh, from our top community this year. The future of this continent, the future of the world, is in good hands. In a few decades, Africa will account for the largest working age population and by the turn of the century, we'll have 40% of global population. So there's a lot of stake at stake here. What we witnessed here were young Africans solving for Africa, innovating for Africa. We just provided them the stage to do so, the stage to show the talent that they have. Hunger Pitch Fest is the largest tech startup competition in Rwanda. It serves as a unique platform showcasing creative talents from across the nation with the aim of championing the use of technology and innovation. Over 300 startups applied, top 25 tech startups enrolled in the bootcamp, and Lupa was the overall winner, walking away with a grand prize of 50,000 US dollars.
um, at, at Lupa, uh, what we're trying to do is uh, uh, help the farmer not be, uh, re not have an over reliance on uh, fertilizer, uh, on uh, inorganic fertilizers, and uh, it has, uh, it, although it has an advantage, like uh, immediately in uh, helping crop yield, uh, overall. It, it has a, a huge disadvantage on the environment and what they can actually get. So the main thing I think that helped in our pitch was that everyone understood the problem because it's a, it's a clear problem that everyone is face, facing with the climate change uh, and the food insecurity that comes with it. And uh, in the solution, um, maybe it's a lot of people are not even familiar with what we're dealing with because we're dealing with earthworms. Yeah. Um, but then again, uh, being able to hear that there's actually a solution to the problem, even if it's going to take time and a lot of, uh, you know, how can I say it, a lot of uh, collaboration with different institutions for us to, you know, to bring that impact and bridge the gap. I think one of the main thing uh, for us that, that's about to change, uh, the game changer even after today, that's not even about the money, is the connection and collaboration we're going to be able to make uh, because this was a stage that where we're going to be able people know about lupa now mm -hmm. um, better than they did or even so uh, there's a door that it opens uh, where we can access different institutions uh, to bring lupa and see the vision that we're anticipating faster than all we could have done on our, on our own yeah you must have heard of that phrase survival for the fittest it stands true, especially for the world of startups. So unfortunately, the startup world is cut, cutthroat. So usually even global, more than 90% of startups really die within the first five years of their, of their life. And, and unfortunately, that's not a different statistics than what we would have in, in Rwanda. But what we are currently seeing, what we are currently seeing and where we need to, to, to be going is, um, but on average, mostly the mo an entrepreneur will succeed on their third venture. So if today we are seeing a young person at 19 years old starting a venture, even if they fail today, this is an, an entrepreneur that, has been, that, ha that is born. And we can assume and there is high chances that on their third venture, they are going to really create an impactful, um, an impactful um, um, venture for all of us and for the world. But also throughout that phase, they create jobs, they're creating jobs. We're seeing a lot of companies and a lot of young people creating jobs. Uh, for example, in some of our hangar alumni, when they came, there were two, three people. One year later, there are 20 people in their own companies. Um, so you can see that today they're creating jobs. Um, we have their feeding families of those people that they're employing. But more than that, we are also seeing some of the solutions that are currently solving when you go into agriculture, you find a company that went through this, there's a particular number of farmers, 5,000 farmers that are being supported to access markets uh, to do that. You find that there's now young people that have a platform where they are getting easy access to jobs than what they didn't have um, the other day. Or we're actually seeing innovation of people who are creating new energy, uh, energy sources, if I can call, call them like that. Um, so there's, there's a mix of, of good stories that are coming out and impact. And I think what our next step is, is to be able, how do we scale this? How do we take these good ideas, take them to the world? but also how do we absorb good ideas that are coming from the world and we also absorb them in Rwanda. Challenges are everywhere and are in everything, especially in businesses. The startup world is not different. They face a myriad of challenges. Some of the challenges that we've dealt with is the fact that we really do need larger um, investments to be able to scale. Um, we currently have our engineer working out of his room and so uh, we do need a bit more investment. Um, that's one of the biggest problems we've faced. Another problem is the fact that um, sometimes logistically it's been difficult. So initially when we first started the company we tested out the idea by using um, battery packs that were coming in from China. And we quickly realized that due to the amount 
that we had to pay for customs and the amount of time that it took to get through customs, that that wasn't actually a viable way for us to do the business, which is when we started manufacturing ourselves. Um, but in terms of opportunities, we've realized that through manufacturing the battery packs ourselves, we're going to be able to create a lot of jobs because our plan w with the next investment that we get is to open up um, an assembly line in the DRC and through that we'll need employees and so we'll be hiring locally and providing jobs for the, um, the community. Innovation is an important role to play in solving some of these challenges. We need new ideas to be able to solve the challenges. We need new ways of thinking and we need people to apply themselves differently. So that's why innovation is very important and that's why we're creating platforms like this. But let's not make a mistake, innovation alone is not enough to solve the problems that Africa faces today. There are two challenges that we still need to, face, to, to, to solve. The first one is financing. And within the financing, there are two issues that are critical. One is financing is very costly across Africa. Across all countries in Africa, the cost of finance is unacceptably high. And that is because of the perception of risk on the continent. When people think about working with any African country, they think that it's Wild West. We're shoving spears at each other or something will happen to their capital. And as such, they charge us a higher price for, for capital. I think part of it is something that we can solve ourselves. We need to start telling more positive stories about Africa and to show examples of what Africans are doing to solve and what Africans are doing to innovate, what Africans are doing in the knowledge economy, because many Africans are actually leading in the knowledge economy. The second issue we need to solve is this problem that even I am guilty of, that when we speak of Africa, we speak of it as if it's one country. So what happens in Niger becomes something that is happening across the whole continent. And as such, people take something that is inherently happening in one country and assume that it's happening in all the countries. That must stop. We must begin to recognize our strength in diversity, but also that we are together. Innovation serves as the lifeblood of startups, propelling them forward in a landscape filled with competition. I think one of the key things, when you look at technology, when we say technology is an enabler, it's because um, you can apply technology in several sectors. Um, and technology is and should not be a standalone application. So fundamental challenges include we need people to have shelter, we need people to have healthy, good nutrition, they, we need our population to be healthy, we need our population to um, we need our population to study, we need all this fundamental access to, for someone to have a meaningful life and what we aim to see is how does technology actually help solve those uh, problems. So just technology is not as simple thing as oh someone has gotten a phone and it's not a useful item to them. That phone should be one. How do they use it for access to to public service, they should be able to do trade on using that phone, they should be able to pay school fees, their children should be used to be able to use that device to, to study and get access to knowledge. So it's a whole environment that you're creating with technology, but also enabling you to fast track some of these solutions. And that's how we see technology enabling us uh, every day. Cities around Africa are thriving in creating tech hubs. However, Connecting rural areas to the technology boom is essential since it ensures more equitable development, empowers local communities and fosters inclusive economic growth across the continent. So there's excitement, um, there's excitement from, um, from other parts of Rwanda and that's where it starts. I think our innovation ecosystem in Kigali when it started more than 10 years ago, 
we really relied on uh, excitement and young people, uh, young people's energy to be able to say, let's sustain this. And we hope the same can, re can be replicated in, um, in secondary cities, but more faster than, faster than 10 years. And we're starting to see good companies actually come out of, um, or starting to emerge, but we hope that in the next two years we'll have better, better results and we'll have one. Some of our biggest companies actually located in Musanze, in Rusizi, in, uh, in, in Mohanga, etc. Information and communication technology has the potential of enhancing teaching and learning activities in schools and higher education. Numerous studies demonstrated the potential positive impact of ICTs in teaching and learning. However, there are still many gaps in fully integrating ICT in teaching and learning in Africa. Yeah, so it's a um... I think it's really important because most of the jobs nowadays that are being created uh, involve in ICT and uh, if, it's, if you don't have like, such ICT skills or such soft skills, it's really difficult for you to adopt to the job market. So it's really crucial that uh, the, the, new, the new employees who are coming to the market to have ICT skills yeah, so that they could also have like, the same chances like others. Um, on the government side, I think, I think one, one thing that is really required is, um, is at this moment, and actually there's a bit of convert, there's a lot of conversation that are happening towards this, is how do we make sure that there's a bit of, um, uh, there's, there's a stronger relationship between the private sector and the academia. And what this means is what? There's a lot of jobs that are coming, and especially in the technology space, jobs are being born every single day. Um, there's AI, AI jobs that were not on the market last year. Um, there's data-related jobs that were not on the market last year. And all those, all those jobs to be filled and all for us to get those, gain those skills is how does academia then learn about this and develop the, the skilling that is required. But also in this age of technology also, it's also upon young people to actually really go out there and acquire these skills because most of these um, most of these information is available so what we are having uh, for, I know for example the Minister of Education is working really hard to ensure that um, the curriculum at university is changed they're pushing for TVET to ensure that people have technical skills uh, within the ministry we are also looking within the Ministry of ICT we are also looking at how we can um, get as many technical and professional skills programs going so that young people can have access to that whether it's on data scientist being a data scientist uh, programming developers etc and then lastly um, in ensuring that um, in ensuring that we try to understand better what kind of jobs are necessary so we we, we already are we're, we're, we're thinking about a digital skills inclusion strategy and we're we're actively trying to work on it yeah.